concept that comes to us from Brother in Christ who took the 12 step program of AA and looked at each one of them as they fit biblical admonition. And we're taking four weeks looking at three of those steps each week. The concept behind this is quite simple. We are all struggling with something. Every one of us to some degree struggles with something in our lives and we want to be rid of it. We're trying hard not to be that person anymore. And so these concepts that have been developed through what we understand in Alcoholics Anonymous help us to see a great way to whatever our problem is, whatever we're dealing with, to walk through it in a process so as indeed uh, to relieve ourselves of it. Uh, the book is 12 Steps to a Closer Walk with God, with Don Humphrey, and I recommend it to you highly. We come now to the uh, second session of our study and looking at steps four, five, and six. And we're using the prodigal son as an example of one who walked through a process to handle his problem. Last week when we left the prodigal, we ended with him in verse 17 of Luke chapter 15, and he came to himself. We now come to the point at which it is incumbent upon someone who wants to rid something from life. The fourth step is to say, here it is. It's time for me to go from being self-centered to being God-centered. As we observed last week, those who are going through that program don't necessarily label their higher power as the God of the universe whom we understand. But when we do that, we then come to this acknowledgement within ourselves that I want to be that way. I want to be God-centered. Not just a God that I want to come up with, but the God of creation, the God of the universe, I want to be God-centered, not self-centered. So the first thing that has to happen in this step is self-examination. We have to look within ourselves. We have to see that I don't want to be me. I want to be God's version of me. Self-examination. The concept of self-examination is fully there in New Testament Christianity. The concept of examining in order to know. Like for instance, Romans 12 and verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that's the same word, to examine, prove what is that a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we've just finished the observance of the Lord's Supper, Paul used that word examine in 1 Corinthians 11 and 28. Let a man examine himself and eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Paul to the Galatians in chapter 6 and in verse 4 said, Let every man examine his own work. Be conscious of who you are and what you're doing. In Ephesians 5 and verse 10, Paul advised those Christians and said, find out or prove what is acceptable to the Lord. Make an examination to know what he wants. So that, Philippians 1.10, you may approve what is excellent in the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 21, test all things. Hold on to what is good. That test, the same word, examine, consider. Even those Christians in that first century, 1 John 4 and verse 1, were told to test the spirits, whether they are of God, so that they would know by the actions whether this 
word was from the Spirit of God or another spirit that was in the world. So self-examination is absolutely an integral part of the Christian experience. In this self-examination, the suggestion is in the program to make what they call a resentment list. Now that might sound rather strange because we don't want to be people who live our lives in resentment. But listen to what they say in the program. It's quite interesting. The word resent comes to us from the Latin. Obviously, R-E, re, means again. But the second part of that word is a Latin word, sentire, and it means to feel. Here's what they say. In order to rid yourself of the thing that bothers you, you need to make a resentment list so that you can feel again the problem so as to understand it and avoid it. Now that makes a lot of sense. If it doesn't bother us, if it really doesn't harm us in any way, if emotionally we're not bothered by it, then why would we want to get rid of it? The example they use in the program is to say this. When I have a problem, this is how it made me feel. And since I don't want to feel this way, then I need to get rid of the problem. It might be an individual, a problem you have with an individual. And you say, this person did this, and therefore here is how I felt, and I don't like it. And therefore, since I don't like it, I want to get rid of the problem. And so I approach the individual. But notice what he's saying. It's the resentment that causes you to move away from it. Now that's extremely biblical. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, Godly sorrow works repentance not to be regretted. You see, when we in our spiritual condition can get to the point of feeling the weight of our sin as it affects God, now we have a solid reason for changing. If it only bothers me, then I can learn to deal with it. But if we know that it bothers God and that he doesn't like it, and therefore I acknowledge that I feel bad about that, then I'll be able to move on. I'll be able to move forward. Therefore, the first thing we do today in this fourth step is to say, who am I? This self-examination. Number two. The next step says to admit what you have found. There's the prodigal. He's sitting in the pig pen. He's wanting to eat the dirty slop that they were eating. And he began, when he assessed who he was, he then said it out loud, this is where I am. I can almost see him sitting there, right? He's not just quiet and solemn. I think he's actually talking to the pigs. I think he's actually trying to have a conversation and he's doing it in order to resonate with himself. This is really where I am. This is who I am. This is what I've figured out about me. I'm going to tell you about it. You bunch of sorry pigs, look where I am. And he's telling them, there's nobody else there. But he's saying this 
is who I am. Here is a man in his assessment who was willing to confess this is how bad things are. What was his assessment? Well, he said this about himself. What I thought would be so good certainly is not. The day he left home, did he have a picture in his mind of sitting in a pig pen? Nope. What he thought he would get turns out not to be nearly as good as he imagined. Number two, the place he left was not nearly as bad as he thought it was. Can't wait to get out of this house, to get my own stuff, to get in my own life. Oh, now he says, you know, it just wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. Therefore, I deserve not to be your son anymore. In fact, he said to those pigs, I'm going to go home and tell dad, I don't want to be your son anymore. I don't deserve it. I really wonder if he had gotten to the point in his life where he was saying, I need to be humiliated. I need to be humiliated. I need to be brought down a notch or two because it didn't turn out like I intended. This man was able to look at himself and to make that understanding. And he could say to himself, yes, this is my problem. And I need to tell somebody else. You see, there's a two parts to this idea of confession. First of all, it's telling yourself. Someone has written that I read, I think it's in, probably in the book, quoting a psychologist who said, confession comes nearer to touching the conscience and healing the mind fully and deeply more than any other thing in life. When he confessed it to himself, he started the healing process. But then when he said, I'm going to go home and tell dad, he was telling somebody else. And that just made it even more sure that he could overcome. Why is it that James would say, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You think God knew that the additional idea, not only of confessing to yourself, but bringing someone else in makes sense? It does because we have a trusted person who can now help us deal with our problem. That's what this whole 12-step program is about. It's about people struggling together, coming together, and helping each other. And we can find that help. Because according to 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 10, there has no temptation overtaken you, but that which is common to all men. You see, when we know, when we understand, when we really believe that everybody else is struggling too, you have problems, I have problems. We're all addicted 
to sin. So you can understand me and I can understand you. It may not be the exact same thing, but it is the same thing. It's a weakness. It's a problem. And I don't want it anymore. And so after I tell myself, when I choose to reach out and to tell you, it invites even more strength into my life. Third, when you sit down and say, who am I? This is who I am. Now you leave it with the Father and let him deal with it. That's where it ends up. What does this young man do? He doesn't stay in the pen. He doesn't just tell himself and tell the pigs. Now he's going to go home and he's going to tell his father, Dad, I'm leaving it with you. Here's what I think about myself. Here's what I think is going on. Here's what I think I need, but I'm leaving it with you. That's the underlying message. The question is interesting. Why would anybody want to hold on to a problem? You ever thought about that? I mean, some people know they have a problem, but they're not really wanting to get rid of it. Why would anybody hold on to such a difficult, rough situation? Well, some people don't get to this step. They never go to this step of turning it over to somebody else because, number one, that's their identity. People who are defined by their problem because they get sympathy. They are noticed. And they sort of enjoy that. How sad to wallow in your problem because you get attention from somebody else. And yet, some people do. Others hold on to their problems because it's just too difficult to change. It's not easy. And anyone in this room who has or is going through a very traumatic situation of dealing with a difficulty and a problem and trying to get over it, you know it's not easy. It's tough. And some people think, I think it would be just easier to stay in it than to try to get out. And so they stay in the pig pen and they become comfortable with the pig slop. How sad that is. That people don't want to change. The Bible teaches us that the only way to get rid of a problem is to turn it over to the Father. That's the only way. Hebrews 12 opens with these words. Seeing we are surrounded, he's talking about chapter 11, those great people of faith who endured all kinds of problems to remain faithful to the Lord. Seeing we are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Jesus has already run that race. He despised the shame. And now he sits at the right hand of God. The writer is saying this. If you really want to get rid of your problem. You have to turn it over to the Father. You have to give it up. You have to set that weight aside. I heard about a farmer 
in the 1800s who was with his wagon and horses going down the road. And he passed a young man, obviously, who was in need. He had everything that he owned on his back. And the farmer said, can I help you? Can I give you a ride? Sure. And the man got up on the wagon and he began to ride. They had not gone far when the farmer looked and saw that the man's possessions in the heavy pack were still on his back. He said, son, why don't you take your pack off and be relaxed? He said, sir, you're carrying me. I can't ask you to carry my burden too. You think we treat God that way sometimes? Do we really give up the burden and set it aside? Do we really just lay it at his feet and say, I can't do it anymore? When that prodigal son approached his father, do you think he had a suspicion in the back of his mind of who his father really was? I think he probably did. I think he was able to say, here's my burden and here's my solution. But I think in the back of his head, he knew who his father was. He didn't expect it. He might not even could have imagined it. But I think he certainly wanted to hear the words where his father said, you're my son. Get a robe, put it on him. I got a ring for the finger that identifies who you are. And we're gonna have a party. When do you think the prodigal felt the removal of his weight? When he exchanged those dirty rotten clothes for the clean ones? When he took a bath and got to wear a ring? And when he and his friends celebrated his return home with a great meal? Two instances in the life of Jesus are quite fascinating. In John 5, there's the story of that pool of water that in that day and time, people who were sick would gather around the pool. And according to the text, a messenger from God would stir the waters and the first one in was healed. And everybody was there at the pool wanting to be healed. Jesus met a man and he looked at him and he said, do you want to be healed? On another occasion in Mark chapter 10, Jesus met a blind man. And the blind man came to him and said, Master, have mercy. And here was Jesus' answer. What do you want me to do? I know those questions sound rather strange, don't they? You take a person who's at the water, ready to jump in. Do you want to be healed? You might think, that's a dumb question. The blind man who called for Jesus to have mercy, what do you want me to do? Well, duh. So why did Jesus do that? It makes sense that he did it because there's something special about the person stating what he wants and then let go of it and turn it over. He who covers his sin will not prosper. But he who confesses and turns from it will. Proverbs 28 and 13. 
And the psalmist in chapter 32 wrote in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin and you forgave. If you're ready to examine yourself, admit what you find and submit to the only one who can take it away, then this lesson is for you. Because we're all sinners in need of forgiveness. And when I'm willing to say, Lord, I'll do whatever I need to do, I acknowledge my sinfulness. Tell me what to do to get rid of it. Jesus takes us with him. And in the waters of baptism, washes away that sin and purifies us, makes us right. And then we submit to him to live the life that he wants us to live, to conquer the difficulties that we face. Today, if you are in need, we're here to help. If you come as we stand and sing.